This is India. Its mountains and great plains bound together by a net of steel. The railways, built during British rule. British built canals too, to water the land. They opened up the wilderness, transforming it into tea gardens and plantations. The British had been in India as rulers for nearly 200 years, building splendid palaces and monuments all over this vast country. Today, many stand silent and deserted, but in the 1930s, it was all very different. The Viceroy, as representative of the King Emperor, headed the government of that part of the country known as British India, and life was generally good for the few thousand British who ran it. The Indian army was the largest in the empire. Most of its officers were British and white, but the troops were Indian. In the country, the government relied on the district officers. A young man in his twenties might well be in charge of an area as large as some British counties. But there were not nearly enough British to rule India, so much of the work was done by Indian officials and businessmen. Indian princes governed the rest of India, but all agreed to British control over defence, foreign policy, communications and trade. In return, they were allowed to run their own states as they wished. Many were extremely rich, and there were some 600 states altogether. They had their own private armies, mainly for show. The princes and large landowners were regarded as friends and allies by the British. But life for the rest of the 350 million Indians was not nearly so comfortable. In the country they had to cope with difficult soils and harsh landlords. Most were very poor. There was extreme poverty in the crowded cities. Life was hard for most Indians. Religion was a powerful force in their lives. Two-thirds of the population were Hindu, to whom all living things were sacred, including the holy rivers, like the Ganges. Many would travel hundreds of miles hoping to purify themselves in the waters of these sacred rivers. Hindu temples were covered with statues and carvings of their many gods and goddesses. <laughs> Hindu festivals were celebrated with offerings and song and dance. One of the most famous Hindus was Gandhi, a leader of the Congress party. He stood up for the ordinary Indian. He believed in the value of Indian village life and crafts. Gandhi thought that all Indians should be free, self-governing and self-respecting. 
especially the untouchables, Hindu outcasts who were given disagreeable jobs. He believed that Indians, not the British, should rule India, and that if they refused to cooperate with the government, British rule would collapse. At that time, salt was taxed by the government, which, as Gandhi pointed out, made it too dear for ordinary people. So, in 1930, he led a march to the sea, where he encouraged people to make their own salt and so avoid paying the salt tax. But he didn't believe in violence. These campaigns won him mass support and put the British on the defensive. Unfortunately, they did often end in violence. In September 1931, Gandhi came to London to attend a conference to discuss India's future. Princes and other representatives from India came too. Gandhi claimed that only his Indian Congress party could speak for all Indians. The other members disagreed with him, and the conference failed after three months of discussion. A vast crowd awaited his return to India. After his arrival, he discovered that Nehru, the other great Congress leader, had been arrested. Nehru admired Gandhi very much, but thought he was too old-fashioned in his religious ideas and wrong in his belief in the value of village crafts. Nehru saw India developing as a modern industrial country. Only then could she be strong and independent of the British. Personally, he said, I dislike the praise of poverty and suffering, nor do I appreciate in the least the idealization of the simple way of life. I have almost a horror of it. His audiences heard a different argument from Gandhi's, but Nehru backed him in the struggle for freedom. The British government was determined to be tough with Congress. Time and time again, their leaders were arrested for demanding independence. Nehru himself was to spend a total of 14 years in prison. Jinnah was the other great Indian leader. He was not a Hindu like Gandhi and Nehru, but a Muslim. About a quarter of India's population were Muslims. Unlike Hinduism, which was a purely Indian religion, Muslims not only belonged to a worldwide religion, but had different habits and customs. The mosques where they worshipped were plain and unadorned. And Muslims worshipped only one god, Allah. In the past, Muslim emperors had conquered India and ruled in great splendour. Though most of them had been driven from their thrones by the British, their magnificent buildings were still reminders of past glories. The problem for Jinnah was how to win back for the Muslims their old pride, and a full share for his party, the Muslim League, in the government of India. But in the Indian elections in 1937, while Congress got control of the Hindu heartland with clear majorities in six provinces, Jinnah's Muslim League had to share the other three with local Muslim parties. Frightened of Congress's power, Jinnah tried to bring all Muslim parties into his league. 